Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss juvenile tapeworm infections. You might recognize the name of one of these tapeworms because we've already discussed it as an adult infection. Today we're going to discuss what happens when we eat the egg of this parasite. And what, what happens next is sometimes quite serious in terms of its uh, clinical consequences. We'll also discuss Echinococcus granulosus, the dog tapeworm. And in this case, we mean it. This tapeworm actually infects dogs. <laughs> Echinococcus multilocularis, which is an infection of foxes. Mesocystoides, an infection of most uh, predaceous mammals. And Spirometromancinoides, again, a parasite. Not so common, but whenever we encounter it, it has some serious uh, clinical consequences as well. And finally, a tenia called tenia multiceps. Let's begin with cystocercosis and neurocystocercosis as caused by the larval form of tenia solium. The geographic distribution of tenia cystocercosis reflects the distribution of pig husbandry throughout the world and, as I mentioned, can result in very serious infection. In fact, the term neurocystocercosis is applied to the cystocercoid stage of the parasite, which has lodged itself in neurologic tissues. And this can occur throughout the central nervous system, but of course the brain is the largest portion of that. And shown here are two lesions, one each, caused by the penetration of the neurologic tissue by the cystocercosis stage as it migrated throughout the body. So here's the story with regards to how tenia solium infection can uh, manifest itself in a much more serious way than tenia saginata as we introduce them. Both adult tapeworms cause virtually no pathology. The eggs of tenia solium respond to environmental cues both in the pig small intestine, which is how pigs acquire this stage of the infection, and environmental cues that it receives from humans. And as mentioned, the uh, physiology of the digestive tract of both humans and pigs is rather similar. So if humans ingest the egg of tenia solium, it traverses the uh, esophagus enters the small intestine, and it is there that it's stimulated to hatch. When it hatches, the hexacanth larva, which is typical of most tapeworm larvae that come from eggs, that then penetrate the wall of the small intestine and enter the blood supply. This is the mesenteric blood supply. They could go to the liver. <clears throat> they can go to the heart. They can go, in fact, once they reach the heart, they can be pumped throughout the body, and they can then lodge in a variety of sites. Cystocircus in muscle tissue would be considered harmless because it just creates this larval stage inside of a vast array of muscle fiber bundles, and it doesn't really cause much uh, damage to the, to the striated skeletal muscle system. So it goes unnoticed. But the moment one of these larvae the hexacanth larvae lodges in either the eye or nervous tissue, such as the brain, of course, or the spinal cord. Then, uh, as it produces its cyst with the uh, juvenile tapeworm inside, uh, th those sites are very sensitive to any invasion from such a large object as a, as a cystocircus stage. And, and we will exhibit symptoms according to which area of our body in terms of our neurologic tissues this parasite has lodged. For instance, shown here is a very rare occurrence of a cystocircus that actually grew up in the anterior chamber of an eye of a patient, obviously, who had probably cystocerci in other places as well. But just by ophthalmologic examination, the diagnosis was made right away. The removal of the cystocircus by simply making a small slit and pulling the larval stage through that slit cures the patient of the infection, at least in this anatomic site. However, if that cystocircus happened to have lodged instead underneath the retina, for instance, near the optic nerve, and caused visual acuity problems, forcing the patient to 
come into the hospital and seek medical attention. When that object is observed through a, an ophthalmoscope, it's often interpreted as a tumor. And it was very common for retinoblastoma to be misdiagnosed when in reality the patient was suffering from cystocercosis. And there is a collection of eyes that were sent to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in cross-section, and this is one of those eyes that shows what the real culprit was, which gave the signs and symptoms of retinoblastoma, but actually turned out to be the cystocircus of taneous solium. Today, we have a much better way of distinguishing these two clinical conditions, so we can be sure of what it is before we act next. Here's a, a radiogram of a long limb showing multiple cystocerci throughout the muscle tissue. So this individual ingested hundreds of eggs. Some of them most likely ended up in neurologic tissue. Here's an incidental finding on a patient who unfortunately died from a mesothelioma, but they were from an endemic center where cystocercosis is quite common. And here is the lesion created by the larval tapeworm. And as I mentioned, it's an incident, this was an incidental finding that the patient was not suffering clinically from the presence of this worm, but rather suffering, of course, from the cancer created by the mesothelioma. Here's an example of a cystocircus in the spinal cord. And indeed, when it's present in that location, signs and symptoms uh, are related to the level in the cord that this cystocircus actually develops. If it develops high up in the nervous uh, system, in the, in the spinal column, <clears throat> then um, perhaps a numbness or a lack of uh, ability to raise your arm above a certain level uh, tips off the patient that indeed there is something seriously wrong and that they should seek medical attention. When this patient was visualized on three different ways of looking, you see in some um, radiogram um, modalities, a ring-enhancing lesion is seen. In others, the actual object inside the ring-enhancing lesion can be seen. And in yet another, it, is, it looks like an opacity, uh, a clear opacity in an otherwise normal spinal cord. This is the same object looked at through three different radiological approaches. The thing that makes these parasites so uh, successful are their armamentarium, and indeed the the cystocerci contain um, a protein called uh, taniostatin. And taniostatin is a protease inhibitor, which prevents, of course, invading cells from um, attacking and perhaps immobilizing and killing these parasitic stages. Now, they're prevented from doing so by the fact that these protease inhibitors are released by the parasite. They also uh, release a, a protein that has a reminiscence of a muscle um, protein called paromyosin. And pyro paromyosin has been shown to inhibit the uh, complete uh, cascade of complement formation so that the parasite cannot be attacked by antibodies, which are produced against it, because the antibodies uh, need to fix complement in order to damage the object. So by inhibiting the cascade of complement, uh, the parasite then avoids damage by the antibodies that are produced. There are other proteases that this stage also produces, which degrade interleukins, degrade immunoglobulins, and interferon as well. So they're generalized proteases, uh, probably of the cysteine protease class. The disease itself presents as a space-occupying lesion and therefore has to be distinguished between a parasite and tumors of various sorts. Cancers, obviously, fall into that category. Local immunologic reactions occur as a result of this parasite's ability to induce immunologic responses by shedding all these uh, virulence factors into the local environment, and that can cause damage to tissues that are unaffected by the parasite's presence per se. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. This time we have a 55-year-old Ecuadorian tailor with a prior history of treated neurosister sarcosis in 2014. Uh, at that point he was treated with albendazole, but now he's presenting with eight days of worsening headaches, blurry vision, nausea, vomiting, and fevers after a recent visit to the country of Colombia. Um, he was noted to have hydrocephalus 
and cystic lesions on imaging. All right, a little more about this individual. He was born in Ecuador. He moved to New York in 2002. Um, intermittent trips back and forth to Colombia um, with this recent return. Uh, when he's there, he uh, reports that he stayed in the city of Medellin. Uh, he has no known tuberculosis exposures. Uh, he does have pet dogs in Colombia and in New York, uh, but denies any other animal exposure. So let's look a little bit at his, uh, his imaging here. Uh, and this is read as showing hydrocephalus with mass effect, including effacement of the sulci and partial effacement of the basal cisterns. Now, I'm going to sort of, you know, I know for a lot of people, it might be a little bit difficult to read um, brain imaging. When I say normally you're going to see sort of a little bit of irregularity along here, but this is almost smooth. And so that, that's the effacement that we're talking about. Here's another image showing it as well. Uh, and so you're going to have enlargement of these are the cisterns. And then you're going to have a smoothing. And I think that's a reasonable way to think about this. So a little bit more. But now we're also going to look at the spine. Um, in addition to the brain images, um, also reported that in the spine, there were multiple extramedullary, um, they say likely intradural lesions. Um, these had a mixed signal and they were read as possibly cystic. Um, and there was some, um, some enhancement as well. So um, this is consistent with um, an inflammation of the arachnoid area, so an arachnoiditis. Now let's talk a little bit about clinical disease. Um, and this is, we're getting into invasive disease with juveniles, right? So this is not just your luminal infection as we talked about previously. Um, invasive disease with juveniles can be broken down into extraneural and neurosister sarcosis. So the extraneural um, can be in the subcutaneous tissue or it could actually be in the muscles. So subcutaneous and intramuscular cystosarcosis. Um, these are usually asymptomatic. Uh, they tend to be painless uh, nodules. They can be in the arms, the chest, um, the muscles, as we saw with our patient early on. Um, but what about this patient that we're talking about? This is neurosister sarcosis. Um, and this is the most severe manifestation um, where the, um, the juvenile forms can actually get into the CNS. Uh, they can um, they can create a number of lesions. Uh, they can be space occupying lesions. A lot of times they can mimic a tumor. Uh, they can trigger seizures in many parts of the world. They're the number one cause of seizures. Uh, you can cause blockage of the flow of CSF, so you can get hydrocephalus, epilepsy. Uh, you can also develop focal neurological abnormalities uh, depending upon where these juveniles might um, locate. People still residing in endemic areas often are found to have more complex disease, may be continually exposed uh, to these, and they have a greater likelihood of having multiple cysts um, and then cysts that might locate to the sub subarachnoid space um, or even the ventricles. Now, how do we diagnose this? This is critical. I'm going to say you want both modalities of imaging. You want to do CT and MRI, and in some cases, you'll use ultrasound. And uh, just to take a moment, why do I say CT and MRI? CT is really good at picking up calcified lesions. Um, MRI is really good at picking up non-calcified. So you might do one image modality or another, and you may see quite a difference in um, what your ability, what you're able to detect. So you really want both modalities in a patient. Um, what about serology? Uh, this could be helpful, particularly if you're trying to decide has a person uh, been in an endemic area, been exposed. Um, so the sensitivity is very high. It's about 98% and the specificity approach is 100%. That being said, the number of lesions are going to impact the um, sensitivity. Uh, so patients who have only a solitary lesion, the sensitivities can be lower, where an individual who has many lesions and maybe has had these for many years, it's actually started to go through the evolution process, uh, they're going to have a higher sensitivity to the uh, serological testing. About treatment. Now here, you're not looking at just treating something in the lumen, you're looking at actually treating um, an invasive infection. Um, albendazole and praziquantel. Um, albendazole is superior to mabendazole, um, better uh, ability to penetrate. Um, there have been a number of studies suggesting that if you add praziquantel to albendazole, you actually get uh, better activity. Uh, so in many parts of the world, both will be used. Um, steroids um, are often thrown into the mix um, because of the concern about inflammation. 
um, and anti-seizure medications are often included, um, not necessarily preventatively, but if there's been a history of seizures. Uh, now I'm going to stop for a second and just say treatment here is a little challenging. Um, there have been a couple times when world experts have gotten together and they've had these consensus uh, meetings where they come up with guidelines. Um, I'm not sure that there's as much consensus as uh, maybe we like to think, um, but we'll think it through this way. And so hopefully this will be helpful. If a person has a single lesion, um, at some point in time, that lesion is going to um, result in, let's say, 10 years, sometime in a period of 10 years, um, that juvenile will will die and you'll get calcification and that will trigger an inflammatory response. Um, you're not sure when that's going to happen. If a person has multiple lesions, they could just keep dying over time. Um, what some people suggest is that if a person has multiple lesions and you treat them, you then know when the, um, when the juveniles are going to die. You can then um, add steroids. You can follow them. Basically, you can treat to get them through this period of time. Um, the idea being if there's just one, it's not clear that they require treatment. But a lot of this is a discussion. You think about it as a patient. If you have one of these, two of these, ten of these, um, there's the discussion about do we go ahead and treat it get through this and sort of know, you know, when the predictable time is going to be when you're going to potentially need steroids or anti-seizure medicine. So there is a little bit of an art. There's a little bit of a discussion with a patient and care provider about when and if to um, provide treatment for these. Now, what about our patient? Now, our patient, we knew he had a history. A cystocercosis serum IgG was positive, as I think we were not surprised. Um, now, this patient was initially treated with prednisone, right? Because the big thing that was going on at this point was the inflammation that was causing obstruction and symptoms. Once um, the inflammation was controlled with prednisone and headaches were uh, decreased in dense intensity and symptoms, then the patient was started on their albendazole treatment. Um, once the albendazole had been initiated, um, they were able to eventually have the prednisone tapered off. Preventing and controlling this infection relates very much to going back to the principles of controlling um, the acquisition of tania solium, which means keeping human feces uh, away from pigs. And in, in most uh, husbandry situations or, or, or uh, the uh, raising of pigs in developed countries, that's an easy thing to do. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier on in our tinea solium discussion, uh, a lot of regions of the world uh, favor people living among their pigs, and then they actually share them as family members until, of course, the tragic day when they actually uh, consume the pig. <clears throat> so close approximation of pigs and people um, favor the uh, transmission of this parasite, not just to the pig, but also to the, to the person as well. To learn more about neurocystocercosis, there's an excellent review that I've selected for you. Uh, and uh, you can see a lot of cases that were accumulated. All of them, um, each case is a unique case in this, in this regards. Uh, and it gives you some feel for the management of these patients. So now let's discuss another larval tapeworm infection, Echinococcus granulosis. The distribution of Echinococcus granulosis the dog tapeworm, in this case, the dog harbors the adult stage of the parasite. The distribution f follows the distribution of sheep husbandry and a reindeer husbandry also. And you can see Greenland is involved in this life cycle as well. But in most places throughout the world, the association of sheep dogs, um, sheep and people um, come together to form a triad of of uh, ecology, so to speak, for the spread of this disease from dogs to sheep, from dogs to sheep, sometimes from dogs to people. This parasite was well known, although um, the parts of the parasite were well known, but it wasn't until much later that they were put together to form a coherent story as to the life cycle. Uh, Gerza actually was able to observe the protoscolics in some of these large cysts that were derived from infected sheep whereas Siebold was able to uh, identify the adult worm as being a dog tapeworm rather than a human tapeworm. And the life cycle is rather straightforward. 
Um, let's assume this is a dog, although it looks more like a sheep than a dog. Uh, but some sheep dogs obviously resemble their um, their counterparts. And so the sheep dog itself is infected with perhaps thousands to hundreds of thousands of these tiny little tapeworms. They're only four segments long. They cause the dog almost no um, pathological consequences whatsoever. And the dog begins to pass the, the um, proglottids that are gravid that contain the eggs. Dog feces is passed into the field. The sheep graze and accidentally ingest some dog feces along with the grass. The eggs then hatch. The hexacanth larva inside the egg then penetrates the, uh, the intestinal wall of the sheep and then migrates via the blood supply and usually lodges in the liver of the sheep. And at that point, it undergoes a remarkable transformation, and it produces a grapefruit-sized cyst over six to eight-month period. Now, the same thing can happen in humans as happens in the sheep, not the dog. So if we were to eat these eggs that are passed in dog feces, the cycle in us would be a dead end, just like it is in the sheep, and it results in a large grapefruit-sized cyst in our liver. It could also occur in other places in the body. If the hexacanth larva avoids lodging in liver tissue, it could easily come to rest in lung tissue or quite tragically, in brain tissue, where a similar size lesion is created by the growth of this parasite. Now, what's going on here is quite interesting because uh, I know that the um, biomedical community is excited about the prospects of therapies based on stem cell research. And if you were to look in, at tapeworms for their stem cells, you could look no further than Aconococcus granulosus. When the larva of this parasite establishes this large cyst, all it takes is one cell from this parasite to generate the rest of its life cycle stages, which are necessary, at least in the, in the case of the sheep, to have available so that when these large cysts are fed to dogs, well, we'll see what the arrangement looks like, but it's rather, it's rather interesting. Uh, and that, that actually is how the, the cycle is completed. Somehow, the contents of these large cysts in the liver of sheep have to be um, taken out of the sheep during the slaughtering process, of course. And the farmer or rancher or Native American, in some cases, feeds the offal, the uh, organs, of the sheep because nobody consumes those. To their dogs, they're good sources of protein, as long as, of course, they don't contain any parasitic material. But as we'll see, the contents of those large cysts contain other cysts, which in turn contain smaller cysts, which in turn contain protoscolices. And the protoscolices are the ones which, when the dog ingests them, all become adult tapeworms. It's the stage that Gerza identified when he looked in one of these large cysts. So let's reiterate the anatomy of the tapeworm to begin with. It's got hooklets, it's got rows of suckers, and it's got three little segments and one big segment. And this big segment contains all the eggs. And here we have two ecological settings. Uh, one is in Ecuador and the other was in the American Southwest, showing traditional farming practices where sheep are being slaughtered. The contents of the sheep minus the muscle tissue is being discarded onto the ground. And just behind her, there are her dogs, and the dogs will then eat whatever falls to the ground. And she will take the carcass of the sheep back to her pueblo, and they will consume the carcass the rest of the carcass there. So this is how the cyst stage of this parasite gets involved in the dogs. In Ecuador, it's a more organized uh, approach to um, meat distribution. This is a slaughterhouse uh, in one of the large cities in, in uh, Ecuador. And what you can see is um, an outdoor abattoir where dogs roam freely 
Sheep are slaughtered. The contents of the sheep are thrown onto the floor, minus the muscle tissue, of course. And these dogs are then quite well fed. And again, if one of these sheep happens to contain one of these large cysts, referred to as a hydatid cyst, then the contents of those cysts can result in quite uh, large numbers of adult tapeworms establishing in the gut tract of that dog. The cyst itself, as it starts to grow, does not, eliminate, uh, does not elicit any immunological reactions to the tissue itself, but it does secrete things into the environment. Those things, those parasite proteins, elicit antibodies, but the antibodies have no effect whatsoever on the cyst itself, which contains a large hyaline wall, rather thick, it's acellular. On the inside of the wall, there is a cellular layer, which gives rise to the daughter cysts. On the inside of the daughter cysts, there can be another layer, which gives rise to smaller cysts yet. And inside those very small cysts, each cell can develop into a protoscolix. A single cell from any of those sites in the hydatid cyst, when transplanted into another animal, can regenerate the entire hydatid cyst. So every cell that we can derive from this parasite from the larval stage turns out to be a stem cell. In contrast to the hydatid cyst, there's a very good reaction that, that you can uh, mount if you're a dog uh, against the adult worms or against the secretions of the eggs because they contain the hexacanth larvae. You can then become immune to reinfection. And dogs uh, have actually been successfully vaccinated, at least in an experimental setting, using products derived from both the eggs and the adult stages. So there's hope that um, sheep farmers can immunize their dogs against Echinococcus granulosis and eliminate the parasite in that way. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. While well, on the infection... Infectious Disease Consultation Service at a hospital in Queens, New York, during January 2013, were asked to see a 29-year-old woman living in Queens who has been admitted to the OBGYN service with suprapubic tenderness. So this is tenderness in the very lower, be lower belly, just right above the pubic bone, suprapubic tenderness. She has dysuria, this is discomfort when she pees. She has left flank pain. So it's going to be over here on the left um, side, a little bit in the back. She has chills and she has fever times one day. Now this young woman reports no um, increase in her urinary frequency, uh, no blood in the urine. Uh, she was married and sexually active uh, with her husband and she uses condoms for contraception to avoid pregnancy. Uh, she reports that the current pain felt like the same pain she experienced when she delivered her children. Uh, she reported a headache with mild neck pain, but no diarrhea, no constipation, no nausea, no vomiting, no uh, dyspnea, no, no trouble breathing, that is, no chest pain. Now, initially, when we see her, uh, there's a report of no travel in the last three years. Um, but I asked the woman, I said, well, let's go back just a little bit past three years. And she says, well, you know what? I was born in Bangladesh. I moved from Bangladesh to the U.S. in 2008. And I was back a little bit more than three years ago, back in January 2010. So just over three years ago, I was back. And when I was back, I was there helping my dad. And my dad has uh, sheep, um, he's got goats, and then um, the dogs um, help him to uh, keep all the animals under control. And she then relates that she uh, is out there with the dogs, as well as when the dogs are not working, they're in the house and basically are treated like members of the family. So she has a very close relationship with the dogs. Now she had a scan of her belly, it's a CT, CAT scan of her abdomen, and this showed a cyst, which I think uh, people can see here. So just to give people orientation, this is the liver, and this large area here of paleness is, uh, this is the cyst. We're actually going to look at an MRI, which is going to give us a little more detail. So we see a large cyst. There looks to be a little bit of irregularity um, inside of this cyst as well. Uh, what, what does the radiologist tell us? The radiologist tells us that um, the CT has a heterogeneous, right? So non-uniform um, mass in the liver. This is a little over eight by five by five centimeters, right? So think about two inches, two inches, three inches, about there. Um, and there's a broad differential. 
It could be a lot of different things is what they tell us. Um, but otherwise, the liver itself is normal. There's no cirrhosis reported. So let's talk a little bit about clinical disease. And, and there's a lot here. Um, the primary exposure, um, the initial infection is felt to always be asymptomatic. Um, people initially don't have any symptoms. Um, but then they can go on and develop symptoms when cysts form, right? So this is a juvenile. It's an invasive um, process. Um, when there is invasive cyst formation, uh, the liver is the most common site. Um, let's say 90% of the cysts going to develop in the liver or possibly the lungs. The lungs would be the second most common site after the liver. Um, but unfortunately, cysts can develop really anywhere. They can be in the bone marrow. They can be in the brain. Uh, they can even be around the uh, outside of the heart. The risk is when one of these cysts ruptures. Um, when they do rupture, the entire contents can actually spill into the surrounding area. A couple things can happen. One is there can be an anaphylactic reaction to the spillage. The other is that the cells that form the, the inner lining um, are actually, they, they have a, um, a stem cell-like potential. And each, each one of these little cells from this germinal membrane can reestablish an entire hydatid cyst, an entire cyst. So as these spill out, you can end up with cysts just sort of all through the, the belly. Um, one of the interesting uh, clinical features that I've seen um, a few times is that when they're in the lungs, if they actually start to leak um, into the pulmonary system, into the bronchioles, um, patients will describe a salty uh, taste to their sputum. Um, the expansion and rupture of these cysts into the biliary tree um, can, can cause an issue as well. And you always worry about these uh, fistulas forming um, in addition to all the things we've talked about so far. This just gives you that distribution um, of where we see the hydatid cysts. So 65%, um, let's say, are going to be in the, um, in the liver. About a quarter of the time, they'll be in the lungs. About 5% they are going to be um, in muscles, a uh, few percent bone marrow, a couple percent in the kidney, and then spleen and brain um, are less common. This is, a, uh, this is a dish filled with these little daughter cysts, so the small cysts that form. These are some histological sections, actually looking through the broad capsules. Um, and so you can see all these different features. Here's sort of the stem, you've got a cyst, and they actually have these small daughter cysts that start to form. And then as I mentioned, here's this germinal layer. These are these cells with this um, uh, potential to form all kinds of new cysts. This is another, like a just beautiful um, picture. And then, um, you know, to complete the uh, life cycle, each protoscolex, if they're swallowed by a dog, can go on and can form the adult tapeworm in the dog. Now, the radiogram of the upper body showing elevation in the right diagram. So we've got here with this diagram, this diaphragm elevation on the right. Um, this is unfortunately in the brain. This is an image of a hydatid cyst um, in the brain itself. Uh, this is the hydatid sand. This is actually something you might find in the contents of one of these cysts um, should you drain it. We'll, we'll talk a little bit very soon about how we uh, might drain these. So let's get into diagnosis. Now, diagnosis, this is a little bit careful. Um, think about epidemiology. Do you have to worry about this? Is there exposure to dogs? Is this an area where there's sheep and we can have this dog-sheep cycle? Uh, what about imaging? Um, is there a cyst that's consistent? Um, serology might be employed. Um, serologies are a little tough because the serologies have various sensitivities based on size, location, and stage. So a single early um, cyst, you might have a negative serological test. Well, later in disease, this will become positive. Um, and then microscopy, you can examine the cyst um, contents. But let's talk a little bit as we get into treatment about how we approach this, because as mentioned, if any of this leaks, you might potentially have problems. So let's move into treatment. Treatment is based in large part upon the stage of disease. And so we're going to go through this. These are um, the different stages. And I, I've sort of changed the numbering a little bit here. You'll see one, two, three, three B, four, and five. Um, because as a clinician, I think about the stages not necessarily as the development, but as how am I going to approach this clinically? So this is a uh, this is actually this chart here is taken from a publication um, that I published a few years ago. Actually, um, hopefully making this sort of a um, 
clinician user friendly approach. So this is our simple cyst, right? So it's one cyst. It's just single wall around the outside. The germinal layer would be here. And now in this case, if it's small enough, you can actually treat this just with albendazole. If it gets to be above a certain size, five centimeters tends to be the cutoff. What you may do is you may initially start with albendazole, but then you're going to do a technique called pair. And I'm going to show you some visuals of what exactly is pair. But this is going to be a way to actually go into puncture, to aspirate, um, and actually do this without spreading. Uh, you can think about it mechanically when you start having septations here. If it's small enough, you might be able to treat and resolve it. But when you have lots of septations, you can actually just aspirate and treat it. You're going to have to either remove the whole thing or you're going to have to put a large bore needle in and break down all these septations. Um, once you get here, the large bore needle to break all the septations is going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, so you may again treat for a little while with albendazole and um, you may actually need to remove these. Now, once you get to the point where everything is dead and it's a solid cyst that's degenerating, um, it's not clear that you actually need to do anything other than just follow these. So you can see our cartoons here, and these are some actual images by CAT scan, MRI, ultrasound. This is sort of this interesting, um, you can see the wall is starting to come off from the side. Um, so let's talk about pair. What is pair? Puncture, aspiration, injection, and re-aspiration. And th this goes back to the 1980s, and it was uh, pioneered um, by a Tunisian team. And what you can see here in this diagram, if people are watching this, is you're going to take a large needle. You're going to go through the thick of the liver. You don't want to go through where you normally might go if you're suspecting bacterial through a small part of the liver. The reason you're going to do this is you do not want any of this these contents to leak back up and get into the peritoneum. So you're going to advance a needle, usually using CT or ultrasound to guide it. You're going to get into the lesion. You're going to puncture the lesion. Then you're going to aspirate the contents. And then you're going to inject um, usually a hypertonic saline. In the past, people might have used um, ethanol. Basically something that will kill um, the germinal cell and any living uh, contents in here. Then you will re-aspirate. And then sometimes they'll actually go ahead and remove the lesion um, once you've sterilized it, so to speak. But here you can see a warning. You don't want to go through this thin area because then what you may end up doing is just spilling the contents into the, um, into the peritoneum. Now, what about our patient? Um, now, our patient had an MRI repeated in early May. Didn't show any change in the liver cyst. Surgical intervention was scheduled. She was put on albendazole for four weeks. Um, a note is we'll do this in the liver, but you want to be careful in the lung because the albendazole may weaken um, the, the cyst and you may actually have leakage. So this was a liver one, so we're okay. She gets her albendazole. She gets admitted. The cyst was approached with a pair, so puncture, aspiration, and when the um, inspiration and then re-injection. And when it was aspirated, the fluid was sent Here's the hypertonic saline, which is being um, put in, the dwell time, the re-aspiration. Um, and uh, at the time of surgery, uh, they actually removed the cyst. The cyst was fully ex excised, and the aspirate revealed these um, hooklets. So the patient was diagnosed with human hydatidosis, um, stage one, treated with several months of albendazole, and our patient did well. Prevention and control. Well... Uh, there is one approach that, that does work in some instances, and that is that uh, an older drug that used to be given to people to treat adult tapeworms, niclosamide, has proven to be very effective in treating dogs that are routinely reinfected with echinococcus uh, on ranches and sheep farms that have traditional farming methods as their basis. Um, using this drug every three months prevents dogs from accumulating large numbers of adults and um, prevents, of course, uh, placing the sheep farmers at risk as well. Of course, avoid feeding any offal to dogs is a good idea, but of course, farmers are very frugal people and they want to use every part of every animal. And indeed, if they're good at recognizing the presence of these hydatid cysts, they can withheld, withhold that from the uh, offerings that they give to their dogs, but uh, usually... Um, Traditional 
farming methods in various parts of the world are unable to resist feeding everything to their dogs to maintain uh, healthy dogs because uh, protein malnutrition is, is quite common in some areas. This requires, of course, educating um, sheep farmers on a regular basis. And because sheep are so common in many places in the world, um, it's, a, it's a daunting task for public health on a worldwide basis to make sure that all the farmers are aware of what's going on. Echinococcus multilocularis is a related species to Echinococcus granulosus with some interesting twists. First of all, the infection rarely infects humans. It's primarily infections of foxes or other canids like wolves and rodents like voles and rats and mice. When diagnosed in people, it is extremely difficult to treat. And it's an infection primarily of people who make their living trapping fur-bearing animals. And those people who do that are obviously shrinking in terms of the numbers of people that are involved in that kind of activity, but nonetheless, uh, there are those that are involved. This is an infection which is found only in the Northern Hemisphere and in the uh, uh, sub-Arctic regions of uh, circumpolar all the way around the world, but in the Northern Hemisphere only. And you can see that reflected here in... um, the general distribution of Echinococcus multilocularis, and and why we know that this is primarily an infection of sylvatic uh, animals. We can see almost no people live in these regions. Uh, lots of people live here, of course. But uh, in the regions that are um, at the extreme end of the Arctic Circle and, uh, and into the Arctic Circle even, um, animals that exist there um, consume each other on a regular basis. And so that's where we would expect to find a Conococcus multilocularis. The life cycle is uh, similar to that found in uh, granulosis. The adult lives in the intestinal tract of, let's say, a fox. The fox passes eggs. The eggs are then consumed by rodents. The rodents develop the larval stage of the infection. And in this case, rather than a large watery cyst, there are a multiple lesions created, which are all linked together by tissue from the tapeworm, and it's called a, um, a multilocular cyst. And when you look at it under the microscope, you can see it almost looks like an egg carton with an egg in each compartment. That's the protoscolacy. When the protoscolix is eaten along with the mouse, hundreds of tapeworms result in that infection, and that reinforces this life cycle. And that's the Arctic life cycle. Now, when people encounter the egg of the parasite from the fox, let's say you're a, a trapper and you've trapped foxes, and the, the fox is disemboweled by the fact that the trap killed the fox by simply cutting into the abdominal cavity. It's possible that fox feces is in the environment and contaminates the hands of the trapper. The trapper then inadvertently ingests some of these eggs. The eggs then travel down through the small intestine where they hatch. The larva then penetrates the wall of the small intestine and migrates, in this case, almost invariably to the liver. And in human beings, this results in in a very different pattern of infection than you would get if it entered the liver of a rodent. Instead of a multilocular lesion that you get in the rodent, all you get in people is a membrane. And that's what makes this such a a daunting task for identification as to what it is. The membrane starts to grow. There are no parasite identifiable objects associated with the membrane. No protoscolices are produced, just a membrane. So imagine this tissue growing in sheets, dividing the liver up. And until finally, liver function starts to fail. At that point, you do radiograms, you biopsy, you try to find out what you can find out about what's going on. And the only thing you can identify is this sheet of material that's strange, very strange. There have been recorded deaths from this, not many, but some enough to know that this can prove fatal. Because when you do immunological staining for antigens, 
it identifies it as an infection caused by Echinococcus multilocularis. Rare, but nonetheless tragic in its results. Prevention of that infection is almost impossible because it's a sylvatic life cycle. So another parasite, a related parasite called Mesocystoides, and there are lots of species of Mesocystoides, involves wild animals depicted here as a canid and an anophilidae. They, they ingest wild other animals like frogs and mice, which harbor the larval stage of this parasite. The mammal, the warm-blooded mammal, then develops the infection as an adult tapeworm. The adult tapeworm then produces proglottids. The proglottids pass out. They release their eggs. The eggs are in the environment. And at this point, it's not obvious what happens next. This is a parasite whose life cycle still needs to be finished in terms of research. But what is known is that eventually the stage of the parasite, which is equivalent to what you would find, let's say, in Diphilobothrium latum, the pleurocercoid stage. In this case, it's the uh, final larval stage, which is now infectious for the adult mammalian host once again. Now, people can also acquire this infection by eating either raw or undercooked uh, animal tissue, in this case, either um, amphibian or, in this case, mice. And they can develop um, infections not adult infections, but rather these larvae can then transfer into the tissue of a human and infect brain tissue and other tissues as well, giving the appearance of a tumor uh, and, in, and making it extremely difficult to make a diagnosis here. Biopsying, of course, is one way that they can see what's going on, but it doesn't have the same consequences as it would if you were to be infected, let's say, with the conococcus granulosis, where every cell is a stem cell. That's not true in this case. So they have made the diagnosis based on biopsies. Treatment is difficult, as you might imagine, if neurologic tissue is involved. Uh, Prosequantol and other drugs have been used uh, with limited success. It's not a very common infection, so there's not a lot of clinical experience with it, and therefore um, we don't know uh, much about its uh, clinical presentation. And, and even we can't even suggest means of avoiding them <clears throat> because all of them were acquired by accident through the ingestion of, of these animals. Now, if you say don't eat them, uh, that's not enough to actually prevent this from happening. We've actually had mesocystoides in the United States, and uh, we don't even know how it got here because it's not, it's not been recorded in any of our um, amphibians or in our uh, mice. So therefore, it remains a very large mystery as to exactly how did this new case of mesocystoides infection in the United States arise? So if you're of a certain uh, propensity, maybe you'll get involved in research that will um, clear this up. There's another parasitic infection that I want to tell you about that creates a larval stage that has very serious consequences. The disease itself is called sparganosis. The parasite is Spirometra mansonoides. Again, another parasite named after Patrick Manson. It's a parasite which ordinarily infects mammals. The mammals acquire the infection by eating wild animals, in this case, cold-blooded vertebrates like snakes and frogs and fish. The parasite is then transferred to the adult warm-blooded mammal. The adult tapeworm grows up, passes eggs into the environment. The eggs enter fresh water. And in this uh, example, <clears throat> the life cycle very closely resembles that of Diphilobothrium latum. The eggs then are eaten by copepods. The copepods are then eaten by these uh, cold-blooded vertebrates, which then acquire the last stage of the infection as a larva, the pleurocercoid. So the stages are the same as, as with Diphilobothrium latum. And then the pleurocercoid is eaten. Now, there are many areas of the world where traditional medicines are practiced because there is a lack of Western medicine or there is a mistrust of Western medicine. Their medicines consist of poultices, and the poultices are derived from the environment. Classically, they're derived from cold-blooded vertebrates like amphibians, snakes, and fish. 
when one takes the tissue of an infected frog that's got a pleurocercoid under the skin and uses the skin of that frog as a curative, you'll say, well, what could frog skin possibly cure? And the answer is surprising because the frog skin actually contains an antibiotic. It's very closely related to gramicidin. It's a class of peptides called uh, meganins. And these meganins are produced not only by cold-blooded vertebrates, by, but also by us. We produce our own set of meganins in our saliva, in our tears, in our uh, urogenital secretions. And they're protective against certain microbes. And people have found this out simply by experimentation, by using various things to try to cure other things, like a wound that becomes infected and becomes an abscess, or chickenpox, the photophobia due to chickenpox, that sort of thing. So these poultices are very common. They use throughout the world. Now, the consequences are very serious because let's now assume that you've caught a frog, you've killed the frog, you've skinned it, you know that the skin of this frog is curative, your child has an eye infection, you apply the poultice over the eye for a certain prescribed period of time, and what is supposed to happen is that the poultice is removed and the eye is all better. And that happens in a vast majority of the cases. But every now and then something goes wrong. And what goes wrong in this case is the pleurocircoid stage is sitting under the skin of the frog. And when you put the skin of the frog on the eye of a warm-blooded mammal, in this case a small child, the pleurocircoid migrates out of the skin of the frog and into the eye of the child. Now, it doesn't actually penetrate the skin of the eye. It actually comes to lie underneath the eyelid as a little white object. And if someone were to think enough to look under the eyelid shortly after removing this poultice, they would actually see that it's there and could remove it, and there would be no further consequence. But that's not usually what happens. What usually happens is that the parasite somehow finds its way to the back of the globe of the eye and begins to secrete material into the environment, which causes a cellulitis to develop. And this cellulitis causes the eye to become all puffed up. Furthermore, this parasite can continue migrating along the globe of the eye until it encounters the optic nerve, and the optic nerve is directly connected to the brain, of course, and as the parasite then follows the optic nerve back into the brain, it can become an infection of brain tissue. Now, the secreted products of this parasite resemble human growth hormone, and as the result, our cells respond to it by multiplying and growing, and, and that's where the cellulitis comes from. Well, now, when this happens in brain tissue, of course, there's a very serious consequence of brain tissue actually increasing in that local area. All kinds of cells are stimulated to divide as a result of exposure to this worm secretion, with lethal consequences in some cases. Very sad indeed. And the, the, that disease is known as sparganosis. And basically, that's, that's all I've said in, in this slide here. If you want to learn more about the treatment of hepatic echinococcosis, there's an excellent review article that I've selected for you. And obviously, there are some references to these unusual uh, host parasite, parasite relationships growth hormone-like factor produced from the pleurocircoids of spirometrid tapeworms is an excellent uh, article which documents this. We've also discussed uh, these tapeworms, uh, various aspects of them, on at least three episodes of TWIP. You can access TWIP at microbe.tv slash TWIP. Next time, we'll discuss Diphilobothrium latum, the fish tapeworm. Thanks for listening. 